Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't think I'm alone in sometimes asking myself why on earth I continue to sit at my desk or in my armchair trying to make sense of Jain logic and epistemology. Even Jain philosophers themselves must have shared, entertained similar doubts, while at the same time formulating doctrines which legitimized the study of their philosophical thinking. One of those thinkers was certainly Hari Badrasuri. According to this most prolific exponent of Jain epistemology and logic, there are two kinds of benefits to be derived from the study of philosophical textbooks. First, our faith in Dharma is strengthened as we recognize that there is a consensus or samstiti of all shastras that temporal happiness is the outcome of virtuous conduct. Second, when we study the basic principles of various philosophical systems in the light of the Jaina Anekantavada, we learn that all of them in one way or other impart true insight. As our knowledge increases and gradually destroys the karmic obstacles, it serves to bring us closer to moksha, the state in which the liberated self is pure vision, knowledge, power, and bliss. Thus, in order to facilitate philosophical studies, Haribada Sura then composed a variety of texts with the logic, epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics of a variety of philosophical systems were summarized and discussed. We might agree or disagree with Haribada Suri. Nonetheless, philosophical studies brings joy to most of us, and we can all agree that different systems of thought have, share common features. In any case, an open and broad-minded attitude towards one's rivals, such as that of Haribada Suri, seems to have been more common among Jain thinkers than Buddhists. After all, the Jains not only indulged in philosophical debates, they also served as transmitters of other non-Jain philosophies. Medieval Jain monks educated themselves far beyond their own specialty into new areas of thought to an extent unparalleled in, Indian, in classical India. One of the systems that Haribada Suri portrayed and discussed was Sankhya. He was certainly not the only Jain philosopher to do so, Prior to Haribhadra Suri and his colleague Vidyanandin, the Dvatrimshika ascribed to Sirasena Divakara devoted an entire chapter to Sankhya, and subsequent to Haribhadra, the examination of Sankhya philosophy was continued by Abhayadeva, Prabhachandra, Vadideva, Malisena, and so on. One of the reasons for Haribhadra Suri, as well as Buddhist colleagues, to indulge in a debate with Sankhya was the prevalent debate on epistemology and more specifically, on the process of knowledge and how the self comes to know. In doing so, several points of divergence as well as of convergence between these systems of thought were highlighted. Needless to say, the result of these debates were of utmost importance to the involved disputants, the omniscient status of their respective founders being at stake. This is made plain by the implication of the following statement by the Jain philosopher Vidyanandin. If the self is intrinsically devoid of knowledge, Kapila would have nothing to say about the nature of reality. Viewing Sankhya from its own particular philosophical vantage point, the Jain critique naturally differed from that level by the Buddhists, although there is ample evidence that these Jain scholars were nonetheless well acquainted with the early Buddhist critique of the Sankhya tradition. For example, the Shatushataka by Aryadeva was studied by Jain philosophers such as Haribhadra Suri and Malabadi. While the Jains shared with Sankhya a belief in the existence of a self, the general did not agree that the self was a non-active principle, although in the 1960s this latter notion did exert some influence on Jain thought. A.M. Patel, the founder of the modern Jain movement, um, for example, maintain that all forms of action, mental, verbal, and physical, are strictly material and thus entirely unconnected to the self, which from an ultimate non-conventional point of view is conceived as a mere passive observer. Such a conclusion clearly deviates from mainstream Jain philosophy and its doctrine of a transforming self and indicates that Patel was influenced by the Sankhyaite notion of the absolute separation of self and matter. Haribhadra Suri's Jain critique of Sankhya rests upon his belief in the fundamental existence of a self, 
although he differs from Sankhya with regard to how that self should be characterized. In the Yoga Bindu, Haribhada Suri presents a hypothetical debate between the Jain and Sankhya philosophies, beginning with the critique of the Sankhya notion that the self knows an object only after the intellect uh, or buddhi has ascertained it. In contrast, Haribhadra Suri maintains that consciousness is identical to knowledge. Thus, at the time of liberation, when the pure self is no longer covered and or conditioned by veiling factors, it nonetheless remains capable of directly perceiving and thus knowing the object without the medium of the material mind and senses. In Ritributal, the Sankhites are said to state that in their view, consciousness is not at all identical with knowledge. Thus, at the time of liberation, when the self is in a state of separation from matter or freedom from material influence, no knowledge can exist on its part. Knowledge, according to Sankhya, belongs to the intellect, which in turn is a product of primordial matter or prakriti. Haribhadra Sura then returns to the initial critique concerning the locus and process of knowledge and asks what it means to say that the self comprehends the object only after the buddhi or intellect has app apprehended it. The following two quotations, the first described to Vinyavasin and the second to Asuri, constitute the Sankhya response to this concern. Sankhya states, by means of sheer proximity, the self, the essence of which is unchanging consciousness, makes the mind, which is devoid of consciousness, a reflection of itself, just as an adjunct, for example, a flower, makes a crystal a reflection of itself. Sankhya further states, it is said by Asur and others that the highest pleasure of the self arises when the intellect has undergone such a change whereby it has become separated from the self and whereby the self is reflected in the intellect, just like the appearance of the reflection of the moon in clear water. While these quotations do not directly answer the question posed by Haribhadra Suri, they do outline the prerequisites that are necessary for the buddhi or manas used synonymously in this context to acquire knowledge. Purusha or consciousness being reflected in the buddhi or manas and buddhi or manas being transformed. In the state of liberation, Sankhya goes on, the object is correctly apprehended by the intellect because of a transformation that allows consciousness to be fully reflected within it. When an opaque stone has transformed to crystal, it is then able to fully reflect the color imposed by the proximity of a substance. Encountering this explanation, Haribhadra Suri maintains that the self is fully reflected in the buddhi, not through a transformation of buddhi, but through a transformation of the self's consciousness. He further maintains that knowledge must consist of this transformation of consciousness. The Yen share with classical Sankhya the notion of an individual self, adding that this individual self is trans transformative as well. Thus, they did not oppose this feature of Sankhya's explanation of the process of knowledge. Moreover, whereas the Sankhyaites believed that the self's knowledge was dependent on the proximity of an object, the Jains maintained instead that having knowledge was one among the self's intrinsic qualities. In the Shastravata Samoshaya and its allied auto commentary, the Dik Prada, the Sankhyaites argue that it's possible for the self to experience an object, in this case the body, without being in connection with it. In the liberated state, the self's enjoyment is not factually an enjoyment of the body, but rather arises as a reflection, as explained by individuals such as Vindyavasin and Asuri. After quoting the already quoted verses, stanzas, Haribhadra Sura responds by pointing to the Sankhya's notion of the non-material and intrinsic nature of the self. The argument that the reflection of the self appears in the buddhi is incompatible with the view that the self is non-material. Furthermore, since it would have too many illogical implications, the liberated self can never enjoy an object reflected in the buddhya. Halabhadra Sura goes on to note that if for the sake of argument one were to admit the notion that in the state of liberation the self attains some sort of different or new nature that enables it to reflect in the buddhya, 
This will lead to the equally illogical conclusion that the eternally unchanging and permanent self has somehow or other transformed a contradiction in terms. In the period between the 6th and 8th century AD, one of the prime areas of controversy between Sankhya philosophers on the one side and Jain philosophers on the other involved the Jain versus the Sankhya understanding of how and where knowledge arises and how the self is able to experience knowledge without undergoing change. The controversy thus dealt with, the with epistemological as well as ontological problems. This focus shifted from the 9th century onwards, most notably among Jain philosophers, who borrowed arguments from the Buddhists in order to criticize Sankhya theories of causality. Many of the arguments directed towards Sankhya philosopher by Jain thinkers from the 9th century onwards were borrowed from Buddhism, notably the Tattva Sangraha by Shantarakshita. The process, as described by Phyllis Granoff, went something like this. The Jain authors allowed one party in error, that is the Buddhists, to refute another party in error, that is the Sankhites. Over the course of time, all reference to Buddhism were dropped. The same arguments were presented as if they had been Jain arguments all along. Phyllis Granos has referred to this period characterized by the influence of Buddhist arguments and the focus on theories of causality as the time in which Jain arguments against Sankhya philosophy were standardized. The Yoga Bindu and Shastravata Samushaya of Haribhadra Suri document a version of the Pratibhimba Vada, the doctrine of reflection, according to which the self or Purusha is reflected in the Buddhi. Such a theory appears in the Yoga Sutra Bhasha, the Yukti Deepika, and in fragments attributed by various Jain author authors to either Vindhyavasin or the mythical As Asuri. Huh? It is therefore reasonable to assume that Vindhyavasin formulated the earliest known version of the doctrine of reflection within the classical Sankhya tradition in order to defend the position that the self retains its unchanging status while simultaneously experiencing knowledge. According to Gerald Larson and others, Vindhyavasin his philosophy is closely related to Patanjali Yoga Shastra and the, of the Yoga Sutra and the Yoga Sutra Bhasha. And thus it may be that Vindhyavasin and Vyasa are one and the same person. If true, the theory of re reflection advocated by Vindhyavasin likely competed with the theory of knowledge of the old Sankhya school of Varshaganya Shasti Tantra and with the theory of knowledge of Ishvara Krishna who was familiar with Vindhyavasin. Over the course of time, the theory of the old Sankhya school was gradually replaced by different version of this Pratibhimba Vada, which then is transmitted by Haribhadra Surya, most notably those documented by Shantarakshita, Kamalashila, Haribhadra Surya. Haribhadra Surya claimed, as we heard, that philosophical study results in temporal happiness and true insights. So I therefore hope that this paper has made you happier and more insightful. <laughs> if not, we have at least in good Jain spirit passed on an important intellectual heritage for poster posterity. Thank you. Thank you.